thank you, Lord, that you are with us and that your wonderful spirit awakens and quickens and blesses us in all that we undertake. Take us up and speak thy word to us and let thy wondrous love come shining through to bless all mankind through Jesus Christ our Lord. I believe in the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of mankind. I believe in human nature, that the good in man is of God and that the bad passes away. I believe in human love, that it is the most beautiful thing in the universe and that where love is, God is. I believe in the divinity of man through Jesus Christ, that we are all sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. I believe that the universe is planned for good, that an unseen tide helps every good cause. I believe in the immortality of every good deed and every true thought. I believe in the creative value of suffering, for it leads us to redemption. I believe knowledge is the foundation of sympathy. I believe in the satisfaction of work well done and in the approval of those we love. I believe in growth, that all things flow, and that no creed, religion or philosophy, no form of government or social order, no standard of beauty, no code of morals is final and perfect. I believe in sunshine, fresh air, friendship, calm sleep and beautiful thoughts. I believe in the great mountains, the infinite stars, and the wind blowing in from the sea. I believe in the hawthorn when it is white, in all gentle things, and I stoop my ear to the silence of the earth. I believe in the forest and in the meadow, and in the night in which the corn grows. I believe in the now and here. I believe in a power that is in ourselves that makes for righteousness. I believe that the only way to reach the kingdom of heaven is to have the kingdom of heaven in our hearts, because I believe in the life, the teaching, the redemption and atonement of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. I was thinking about these beautiful thoughts in meditation. And then I remembered the choir of the uh, Metropolitan, the Russian Metropolitan Church Choir in Paris. And suddenly I longed to share this beautiful singing with you. Because this choir, although they sing in the Russian language, they open out a full and wonderful communion with the Father. I want you to listen to it. But in your listening, believe that the whole of heaven is open to you and that all the glory of God is shining in you and around you and all about you, that angels are joining in a heavenly choir and that the whole universe is ringing 
with a sacred hymn they sing. I believe, and you will know that language is no barrier, that faith and love, inspiration, worship, adoration, transcend all these things in human nature. And thank you, Father. We listen with you, Lord. Oh, God. 
What words can we find even to describe such an experience? I believe. Yes, of course, we believe. Whether we live in Russia or China or England or the United States, whether you are an African in Nigeria or South Africa, an Eskimo in the Arctic, a little girl in a jungle. We believe, Lord, for thou art the very life within us. We meet you, Father, right here in our midst. And all is well a thousand, thousand times well, now and unto all eternity, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Peace. harmony and perfect love. Isn't it wonderful? I love you. And those words are the most vital words in any language. I love you, and that love opens wide the gates of paradise on earth for all mankind. So we have this moment, this sacred moment of communion together. Thank you for listening. I know that together we can truly believe in this brotherhood of mankind because that belief is fixed deeply in the hearts and minds of all people everywhere. A day or two ago, I was standing overlooking a river. The sun was shining, the birds were singing, a lovely stream was coming down from the hills. I saw a trout leaping in a pool far below, and the peace of God was with us. And suddenly, in the midst of this divinity all around me, I found I was looking at life itself through divine vision. And I realized that the real problems of mankind were all inherent, basically, in our relationships one with the other. I saw how easily we fall into the error or the trap of judgment of one another. How easy it is to be hurt, to be wounded by the barbs of tongues of other people. And how we are very much consumed with self-interest. There is a great lesson to be learned in the Christ way because on the one hand our highest destiny is to become Christ-like, on the other we are, as it were, entangled in the world of human emotions. We have to live with one another. We find pains and problems in our emotional relationships in family life. We get hurt when love dies out and wonder where we are going to go next. We discover that other people are not quite like we are. And if we be lifted up in spiritual values, we are very quick to discern the weakness in other people. And sometimes, as I said, we fall into the error of pointing a finger at their weakness. Particularly, of course, if that relationship is a close one between friends or even between uh, a man and wife or people around us 
who are very closely identified with everything we are doing. I would like to think that we can stand fast together in Christ and meet every situation the way Jesus met it. I am quite sure of this, that we all meet our Garden of Gethsemane. I know that in everyone's life there come deep and intolerable burdens. There are periods when darkness descends and it is so great a darkness that we wonder where in the world we are going to go next or how we are going to find release from it. And in that darkness there is deep despair. But Christ comes by his supreme example the supreme example in his own garden of Gethsemane when the burden of being led to the cross, the feeling, for he was human, you know, the feeling of nails in his hands and feet and wounds in his side, the pain of death, the awfulness of people, with their barbs pointed to his heart. Even he, our great Lord and Savior, said, Lord, Father, if this cup can pass from me, let it be so. But nevertheless, thy will be done. And out of the surrender of his own being, this God amongst man, giving his own life, came the greatest revelation that mankind has ever known. He took upon himself the sins and burdens of the world. He revealed the brotherhood of man, the redemption of man. And through his sacrifice, while he was yet in the flesh, he showed the possibility of every one of us to move out of our own gardens of Gethsemane right up into the clear, perfect aura of divinity in the living Christ. That is why I believe in the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man. That is why I cannot help but believe in good thoughts, in kindness, in gentleness, in the beauty that surrounds us. I believe in the divine order that moves in every life forever yearning to lift it up into its perfect fulfillment. And I have come to know in this ministry of divine healing that we wound ourselves every time we fall into darkened thoughts, every time we twist our natures by looking at the twists in other people's natures. I am quite sure of this, that every time we meet a darkened condition, a fear, a worry, a turbulence, a conflict, an unforgivingness, a wounded pride. All these are the signs of God to us personally, given to us with all compassion, all understanding, teaching us that we must move out of darkness into his light, that these problems are not what they seem to be, they have to do with necessary experience so that we in turn may know the pains and pangs of other people. When I look about the world and see all the broken homes, the loveless lives, the pain and the suffering that bring about such grievous conflicts amongst mankind and which in the end produce our wars, how deeply do I also realize the urgency of our need to find this great love tolerance in which we may have a supreme understanding of the other man's point of view. How deep is the need of man to know the Christ, to arise in his divinity and to stand fast in the light, knowing that in the light of the living Christ no darkness can ever prevail. It is as though the Lord gave us a great light and said, if I give you my light, you must bear that light into darkness so that you may observe the light transcending the darkness. 
And how could you know the suffering of others if you did not experience it yourself? You can only find authority in the sublimation of suffering as you pass through these veils of tears and darkness in your own consciousness. I bid you go forth as my disciple, a light unto the world. I bid you embrace the problems of mankind and sublimate them even as I sublimated them. That is what Jesus is telling us. To know that it is a great honor to have these dark conditions come to you because it gives you the opportunity to arise and be free and in finding that freedom to find it for every living soul on earth. Beloved friend, I can only believe in you. I can only believe in your immortality and in the immortality of your every good deed and every true thought. Whatever suffering you are passing through is but the gateway into paradise. I believe in the sleep that you can undertake in the kingdom of God. I believe that you can wander across the face of the earth and in your immediate environment as a spiritual being poised and centered in Christ. And I believe that you were born to become in the image and likeness of Christ, to move through the eternal spheres of an eternal life like an angel of light. I believe that the only way you or I or anyone can find what we are really seeking, the kingdom of heaven, is to know that we have this kingdom in our own hearts and that it has been safely and eternally planted there by the salvation of our Lord Jesus Christ. I believe in you. I believe in our Lord and Savior. And thank you, Father. In this benediction which follows, beloved friends, Know that you believe. Thank you, Father.
Thank you for your holy presence here in our midst. And we are come in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ completely to give ourselves into thy keeping here tonight. Lord, thou art the King that reigneth in all creation. Thou art the Spirit in whom we live and move and have our being. Lord, in all simplicity, in all honesty, and in all love for thee, take our lives and reconsecrate them to thee. We pray here in this assembly that thy will may be done, that thy love may so overshadow our weaknesses that we may be lifted up in Christ to behold thy perfection in our own lives. Lord, we acknowledge that we of ourselves are nothing, that we can accomplish so little without thee. We know how much we need thee, Lord, in all things. Take us up, then, and thank you for taking us just as we are, in spite of our weaknesses, in spite of all the failings we express day by day. Thank you, Father, that you will take us always as we are when we come to thee. Lord, we come now together with our worries and tribulations, with our fears and our frustrations. Take us, Lord, remold us in thine own image and likeness, and thank you that you immediately respond, that we are immediately filled with thy peace, that we are resting now in the midst of thy glory, and even as we become blessed and healed and strengthened, we pray that all people everywhere in the world may receive their share of the blessings we are accepting for ourselves. Now, Lord, speak to us in our hearts. Let thy peace fill our entire beings, and above all, let thy will be done, not ours. So thank you, Father. We leave ourselves in thy care. Thank you for everything, for perfect everything, for ourselves and for everyone else, everywhere, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The moment we pray, in fact, the moment we assemble for the purpose of praying, we are naturally in the very presence of God. Anything less than that isn't worthy of a second's consideration. We are here in the presence of God, Christians together, willing and eager and ready to worship coming to offer our faith to him, believing in that presence. And of course, the great Lord of creation knows all about it. Isn't it wonderful that your heavenly Father knows that you are sitting there, knows exactly what is going on, knows perfectly what each one of us is going to receive from him, I think it is, and I think it simplifies our entire approach to prayer when we set out with that complete recognition that of course there is only God, an omnipresent God, a Father who has listened to our thinking ever since we were born, a Father who knows everything that moves in the entire cosmos from a grain of sand to the petals in those lovely roses, right on through to all the great universes in their millions out there in deeper space, and exactly what he intends in your life 
I think it simplifies things enormously when we take Jesus Christ at his word and say, right, Lord, there is my life. You take it. You look after it. I give it to you. I lay it down. When we are so sure of this living presence at all times that we can step boldly away from the trials and the tribulations and the worries and the fears and the tensions and the resentments and all the things that clutter up our lives and which reflect right out into our physical systems, creating much sickness, and right out into our environment, not only in the immediate environment, but right out across the whole world, until what you witness on a world scene is really the erupting, wrong thinking of millions of people. Millions of people who are not standing still in the midst of God, totally committed to the living love, the living faith, whereby alone man can continue even to live upon this planet. There is no accident about you or I being here in this church at this time. And it is only common sense, therefore, since you have not come to listen to me, but that we have all come together to be in the Father, to make ourselves available to him. It is only common sense that we should then really seriously ask ourselves, and what do I expect to happen to my life? Now I am in the presence of God. I think it's a very worthwhile question. What do you expect to happen to your life because you are now poised in the Spirit of God? What do you want to happen to your life? And that also is an important question. You are an eternal being. Where are you going and why? What is your immediate destination? What do you want to happen to your life in the years that remain to you upon this plane and then on and on into the greater ways ahead? Are you doing everything necessary? To make that total committal so the power of the Spirit can move freely into all your thinking, into all your actions? Are you really exercising your own love on that Christ-like level, which is the divine intention for you and for everyone? Are you really exercising your simple faith in God in the midst of day-by-day -day experiences? If not, then this is a wonderful moment for setting up a new vision and a new objective. Because, obviously, every one of us needs to know more about the workings of the Father, needs to move into greater and greater ways of expression. Every one of us needs invincibility, needs to be free, needs to know that sense of deep security, needs to know how to maintain mind and body in states of well-being, in states of health, needs to know about a God who can guide us through the problems and difficulties that inevitably will move into our experience down the years. Everybody on earth is yearning inwardly, panting, the soul is panting to find its establishment in the living spirit of a father who is absolute power and absolute love, absolute perfection, and a father who, moreover, according to Jesus Christ, is the one who loves us. I think we 
are moving out into these wonderful ways, you know, again today. We are rediscovering the urgency and the necessity of the human being, the human soul, to discover these great reaches, these infinite horizons, where we can go forward in our own dedication, where we can be receptive to the almighty power, where we can begin to believe through our faith in the mighty works of God, moving in the individual life and spreading out through the collective life. We are here in this very ancient city of Colchester. Settlements have probably been here, oh, from the very primeval beginnings of life in these islands of England. The Romans came. They brought a new kind of culture. And all down those thousands of years, people have lived and died. God has sent them into life right here on the very spot where we are sitting. Family life has gone on. People have passed along into heaven. And the whole culture has arisen. Now, some modernists think and say that what you do is the only important thing, what you do now in this time. But then, you see, we forget that everything you do today has already been conditioned by what millions of people have done in the past. You are at this moment, if you like, on the crest of a wave of expression that has arisen from the ancient times and has arisen through the consciousness of all the millions of people who have ever inhabited this world. You gain by what others have experienced. You add to it that which you have to contribute. And I want to remind you about it because there is much more to worship, to being with the Father, than just coming to see how much you can get out of God to bolster up your own ego. You know, you can be terribly selfish in spiritual things, just like one can be selfish about material things. And in the light of all the experience which by the grace of the Lord has come to me in a ministry of divine healing, there's one thing I know for sure. And it is that where love abounds, healing abounds. And that love means how quickly can we help each other to give ourselves away, to surrender ourselves to God in love, and to surrender ourselves in his love to be an ambassador, a disciple to the people we meet day by day. Sometimes when we capture some new vision about the power of the Spirit. We think, oh good, this is a wonderful method for me. Now, if I do this, I will be comforted. If I practice this faith and this love, I'll get my healing. If I walk with God, my opportunities will awaken and arise. If I practice the spiritual principle, I will be secure, I will be surrounded by loving friends, I will move into the greater and greater way of expression. And you certainly will. But not if your whole attention is fixed upon God as a method whereby you can get something of God to bolster up your own economy. If you're looking to God only for what you can get out of him, you're missing the whole point not only about ministries of divine healing, but about the far more important thing, the revelation of the way of Christ in its urgent and absolute necessity in the unfolding of the human soul throughout all eternity. Until the Christian really understands that the motivating force of the whole universe 
is love in expression. And that this great law of love is absolute in its importance and that it is infallible in its movements of harmony, of peace, of healing, of well-being, and that every time love goes outward, it brings a corresponding blessing in return. Not when you're looking for it and saying, yes, well, if I express love, then I've operated law and I'm going to be blessed and healed and whatever because I've done it. The great hurdle, it seems to me, is how by the grace of God can we really believe in this law of love and say, Father, there's my life. Unconditionally, take it, use it, send it now into action. To bless everybody else. That thy love may shine through into my work. Into the work I do for you in my kitchen. To every person I pass on a street. In sacrifices that others might live more nobly because I passed their way. In visitations to the sick. In bearing the living message of Christ. To everybody who is weaker than yourself. This wondrous way of love is the way to healing when love is expressed unconditionally and the power of the Holy Spirit moves freely through mind and soul and body to accomplish that which is true to your Christ-like nature. I remind you of this because we are living in the most dangerous age in history. An age when man's foolishness, his hatreds and bitternesses, his lack of vision about the Christ way, has come to such a pass that he can simply take his civilization right off the face of the earth altogether. And Christians of all people on earth today simply must face up to their own responsibility in bringing forward the new dispensation which is certainly awakening up and down the world. For even though this is the most dangerous age in history, it is also the age of the greatest opportunity that man has ever known to bring forward the dynamics of God into action to reveal to a startled world how wrong it has been and what a scientific divine answer there is to the human problem. There is no time for complacency. There's no time for apathy anymore. What Christ is really looking for is people like you who will say, yes, Lord, I'm with you in this. Just take me just as I am. Set me into action. And I will take my stand for the absolute love, the absolute faith, and the demonstration of the works of thy spirit, moving through me, the little individual, to everybody I meet. Then you are arisen into the new dispensation. And you, as an individual, linking up with others of like mind, become really the new church of Christ, of the new age, the working church, intent upon the salvation of the world, which is a thousand times more important than being intent upon how to get something put right in your own life. For the secret of divine healing doesn't lie in looking for a divine plaster to come and stick upon an arthritic knee. Divine healing depends upon the turning away of the whole soul and mind away from everything that has to do with self. It has to do with your faith in a law of life, in a power of the Holy Spirit that dwells within you, of a Lord who walks with you through every situation and whose power is paramount and infinitely greater than any of your own weaknesses, sins, miseries, pain, dilemmas, sickness, and whatever. Christians of today have to see a new vision 
the vision of the dawn of the new Christ age and to move into it with that wonderful sense that you are indeed the most privileged people on earth to be alive at this time in human history. A time of his greatest danger, a time of its great adventure into this new dawn. For it's people like you who initiated the very church of Christ in the very early days when, of course, the church was a working church with the signs and wonders of God flowing through the people through their offering of their own faith and their own love. It was the people who prayed for other people and saw the healings of Christ moving into their lives. Somebody like you, any ordinary man or woman like you or me, would meet somebody who was sick and perhaps that person would say, do you know any way in which you can help me? And you would say, but of course, Jesus Christ knows how to heal you. In the name of Jesus Christ, let your pain things disappear. And those people with such expectancy, of course they found the power of the Holy Spirit. And they were astonished when somebody wasn't healed in response to that kind of prayer. Because they had grown accustomed to paralytics standing up and walking, to the deaf hearing. They expected when they prayed that the power of the Holy Spirit, transcendental in its nature, would simply move into that person's life and put it right. But it was the people who believed that. And Christians must again today find their own vision their own dedication. We make much, for example, of ministries of divine healing. And I agree, they are wonderful ministries because they encourage people to exert their love and their faith on a level of expectancy in which the power of the Spirit can come in when we make ourselves available to Him. But if we then make divine healing the be-all and end-all of the great Christian principle and objective, then we're lost before we start. Because divine healing at its best, and it's a wonderful best, but at its best is only a rescue operation. Nothing more nor less. Prayer was not God's great gift to man, only so that he could be rescued when he got into trouble. It had a much bigger purpose than that. When you build a city, and if there's a river running through it, no doubt there will be many life belts hung along the walls of the city, and a very wonderful purpose they will have. But it would be ridiculous to say, well, we have life belts, and where we put life belts, we will build a city around them. The life belts don't become the important factor of city life. They are but a useful thing to throw into somebody if he falls into the water. You pull him ashore, you set him up again, and he says, thank you very much, I will now go back to my office. I will get back into life. And that's what a rescue operation is. The Christ way of life, too, is a very fine and wonderful way of preventing disease. For when you are poised in the spirit with faith and with love, your thinking is freed from the worry and the tensions and resentments and bitterness and feuds with other people and all the things that produce so much sickness. It is a wonderful way of preventing disease. But it is still not the purpose of prayer, just to prevent disease. The Christ way of life was not given to man just so that he could prevent himself from becoming sick. Wonderful though that is. No, the great and eternal purpose of Christ's redemptive and atonement message 
His life revealed to us was that you and I are the sons and daughters of God and that we're here to be co-heirs with Christ of the kingdom. That we are here to be co-partners with Christ in the production of a wondrous way of life. And that prayer linked with love and faith produces that partnership. And it is a partnership of creativeness in which each man and woman finds objectives and proceeds to fulfill those objectives. In which a man or a woman looks into the secret places of the soul and discovers the gifts that ought to be coming out into expression and moves out with the power of the Spirit to lead them into that fulfillment. It becomes very well known that man without an objective is lost. That is why you were born to be Christ-like, born to be the sons and daughters of God, born to know that you have at your disposal all the power of the Holy Spirit to move in your life and through your life into the great awakening that leads you always to the fulfillment of God's will for your personal life and God's will in your relationship with everybody else. The only conceivable purpose for our being here today is that we shall arise out of the lesser things and stand forth in the power of the Holy Spirit, knowing that we are moving onto a higher level of experience and taking that experience with us in love and in faith tomorrow in the midst of our work and next week and next month. And if we've been sick, to turn our attention to the Father Away from the sickness, Lord, I offer you myself just as I am. Take me, Lord. Consecrate me to be about thy business, irrespective of my sickness, my sin, my weakness, my fears, my worries. I'm finished with that, Father. Just take me as I am. I repent the past. I give my life. Now what can I do for you today, Lord? Whom can I serve? What great act of love can I initiate today? What great sacrifice can I offer that someone weaker than myself might be advanced through something I can do in your strength, Lord? What great demonstration of faith can I put into motion this day? Lord, there is my life. Reconsecrate me now and send me forth about thy business. I will walk in the power of Jesus Christ. And I can do all things in Christ who strengtheneth me.